poem me a line of geese flying south. I'll pigment you an autumn sky. Rhyme me a sound of rains in the night. I'll draw you the wind's wild cry. Living in the mountains feeds you. <laughs> so he was working at the hardware store part-time because he was painting and trying to sell his work. The guy who owned the hardware store said, I'm going to do you the best, greatest favor I've ever done anybody. I'm going to fire you. He was selling paintings at the bus stop. This area could sell more art than Newburgh Street. He did things for Ford Times, a book called Ford Times and from different parts of the, the country. That was a biggie breakthrough. I did about 150 cartoons. Although I liked the Vitreous Flux paintings, some of his early work were fascinating because they captured the disappearing America. My older brother, he was 18 at the time. He came around a corner, but there was a big mural truck parked right around the corner, and my brother's card went right into it, I guess. He painted some shockingly sad pictures, and it was because of the loss. Everything in David's life was about self-discovery. Uh, whether it was painting or making music or writing poetry, just having amazing conversations. It was a deep and joyous expression of life, which was the art of allowing. He invented Vitreous Flux, mastered it, but kept looking for new ways to paint without using the paintbrush to see how far he could go. It was a time when we all came together as artists. The community, though, was very amorphous. It wasn't, didn't even have a name. If it had a name, it was drawing group. He was like one of those bohemian 20-year-olds that was wandering all over. Only he wasn't 20. He was probably in his 50s. Going up to Jackson was kind of like going to Paris in the 1920s. But instead of Hemingway and Fitzgerald, you were meeting David and Ernie. And I would be drawing them trying to capture the moment, and he would be drawing the influence of the moment. He said over and over again to take a chance. If it doesn't work, start again. And he didn't like it at first that other people were doing vitreous flux, too. Kathleen gave him a, a challenge. He was real. Simple, yet he had a profound way about him. That's the genius. I had to know if I was walking in a dream. So I quickly crept up the stairs as fast as an old man can, to my room, then to my bed, happily. I found I wasn't there. If a David Baker painting speaks to you, go closely and see what's been whispered. Hello, I'm Judy Faust, and I'm here today to do a very special on David C. Baker. Um, I'm going to read some selections from his one and only book called Blue Tarp um, that he wrote in the 1990s. Uh, he was primarily an artist, but uh, he loved music and he dabbled in pretty much all the arts. And when he found out he had cancer, he put down his brushes and he began to put together his poetry. And this is the result of that. It was a very limited edition, and this is one of the last copies of his book that I'm holding in my hand. He was my friend. I met him in Jackson, New Hampshire, when I was a young artist that um, wanted to meet uh, a master artist, and everybody said, go and see him. So I did. I knocked on his door, and we started a wonderful um, friendship. These poems are about his life in New Hampshire, his musings about his pets, and you will see his humor and his depth as I read his poetry. So let me get started. And what I love about his poems is 
a lot of things, but you get a feel for what it was like in New Hampshire when he was living, which was, uh, he was up there 1951 to 1999. He died um, just about on Christmas in 1999. A sprig of green, we moved in, neighbor to an apple tree in our backyard, too small to hold a swing, I think. It grew as we grew, a graph of seasons, of our history, rusting place for an old car, meeting place for lovers, fruits for all, a wedding bower, arms of blossoms falling, a screen between us and winds off Iron Mountain, a white silhouette beneath heavy March snows, now 50 years have gone, no limbs to dance, Returning cedar wax wings fly by. Tonight, I'm warmed. The burning logs I poke closer together. Applewood smells of memories. In our backyard is a stump. Shading a spring of green. Too small to hold a swing, I think. To it bird. After years of picking up after birds, their feathers, that is. I accumulated a large bagful, fluff stuff, fragments of flight, lust, or fight. Then, on a cold midwinter day, my mood filled thoughts of spring. I emptied the bag on a tabletop, sat down to build a bird. I called it it bird. When done, I built a nest, an all species nest, using dog haired thread of wool mud swatches, hair from a curried horse's mane, then eggs from empty nest debris, and hung it in the mountain ash tree. And I watched from a window not far away from my freeze tree sculpture. A gratifying response, they all came. Word of beak, flying room only. They flocked to my one bird show. <gasps> Critics all, a terrifying review. In fact, a whirlwind, a frenzy ensued. Cacophony, they attacked as one unmade my nest of babble, setting my it bird free. Still looking my eyes just above the windowsill, hoping they didn't know that the artist was me, it bird exploded in the air. No memory of aerodynamic grace, as far as I could see. Each feather returned to where I should have let it be. Hummingbird feathers to a lilac bush where nectar flowed a season ago. Wisp of pileated spiral to a hollow tree. Catbird went to the apple tree where he had almost caught a caterpillar. The caterpillar was still there glaring from his cocoon lair. And as far as for the quill of crow, I really don't know. As David grew older, he wrote many poems about what the experience of being old was like. Poem to the Blue-Haired, overfilled with ecstasy as I had thought long outgrown. A buoyancy of joy I had to know if I was walking in a dream. So I quickly crept up the stairs as fast as an old man can to my room, then to my bed. Happily, I found I wasn't there. So I sat on the stairs as anyone would and thought of ways to save enough of this day for the morrow and the morrow and every morrow that would wait for me. David lived in Boston um, during his early life, and uh, he also showed his uh, paintings um, on, um, on Newberry Street in Boston, and he sold a lot of his work in many other places all around the world. I love this poem, it's called I, Stranger. Becoming a stranger takes time. I circled Copley Square again, as I'd done so long ago. Trinity Church is smaller now, shadowed by Prudential Tower. 
The gardens are so far away from Boylston Street. Down Newberry Street, where the masters showed, since then many of those walls I've shared in galleries, now no longer there. I felt a stranger glance my way. I read his mind that seemed to say, that old man does not seem to know just where he is today. I smiled and minded back. I know I'm here. It's just that here doesn't seem to know. David was very kind, very generous to everybody. And this is called Bill. The bell in the studio sounded. I put my brushes down, climbed the stairs, and found a stranger at my door. He said, may I bring in a friend? A tall man with a cane came in, sat down, and said, Where is David? I took his hand. My friend I hadn't seen in years, professor of English, artist, poet, and blind. God damn it, he barked. Where are the paintings? I brought them one by one and read each one aloud. That's why he had so many friends. <laughs> um, this is, this is fun. Another one about aging, novice. I overheard a novice senior citizen say, I've never been old before. I recall the day I could walk a straight line to the door when I had use for a hairbrush, when all stair risers were the same, when I could tell a good joke and hear applause and the cry for more. Of course, there are certain benefits that were worth waiting for, like forgetting things I'm happy not to recall. The book is called Blue Tarp, and this, is, um, this poem is called Blue Tarp. An uncommentary, facts, farce, fantasy, reflections and shadows, dissonance and harmony, essence of nature, Dogs, cats, birds, still twisting and turning in a free fall. I love this poem. If you're a dog lover, you're going to love this poem. It's called Tales Never Sleep. A dog is worth watching. Note what his hind legs do. How they trust blindly, faithfully, following everything that the front legs do. A little late but almost always there because the front legs get there first. Nature leaders, now his nose is overworked. Nasal intelligence, forever reading, insatiably reading to that tail, that broadcast to the air. Fear, joy, searching, obeying, in constant choreography of a dog's day. Watch the articulateness of a boxer's stub, the leathery flamboyance, of the Afghan hound. The tale records where a dog goes, and then, even when doing nothing but dreaming, tales never sleep. I like this one too. You ever get up early and, and really take in the dawn? This is called Dawn. Night crickets, metronome slows, sun's ray through a three minute eggshell glows. School bus yellow, end of driveway, horn blows. Metallic crescendo, roar of traffic rose. Songs drowned out of feathery blur to the feeder goes. Night cat returns and goes to a still warm bed, she knows. Okay, this one's called Pussycat. My pussycat came unglued. She wanted out at eight. And then we called her back near bedtime, kind of late, but called from two different doors, the front door and the back. Confused, she had such adoration for us both. Which way to go? Then suddenly, with cat-like grace, entered both doors at once, walking on her hind legs, walking on her fore. She rushed to the litter box and pulled herself together. <laughs> and this one, I love this one, Ralph, our new cat. <laughs> this cat, this poem reminds me of the time I was flossing my teeth and uh, in the living room <laughs> and a 
something hit my cat and she jumps up like uh, like as if she had just heard an explosion. <laughs> this is Ralph, Ralph, our new cat. So much like a pawn shop Venus with a clock in his navel. Ralph, so smart, second hand or third to us. Quick to reach, whoops, quick to teach his ways. Wakes up at 6 a.m. sharp, Eastern breakfast savings time, then is first upon the couch to sleep to the daily news. And on top of the TV, a bouquet sits, aging tiger lilies, suddenly dropping two petals on the rug. Ralph wakes up with alarm. All right, a couple of more cat poems. The Tale of Gregarious Bird. Who preferred to eat alone, and Hieronymus Bosch, the cat, with fur the color of black oil sunflower seed, as bird preferred, together they lunched, and simultaneously reached a state of sate. Then Bosch reclined, bulged to sun, between her toes a quill or two, tail a gregarious bird. Oh, okay, this one's a little sad here. What happened to that cat? I don't know how many cats the bakers had. They must have had, like, huh, at least a dozen. A dirge to Hieronymus Bosch. The cat must have heard my engine start to mow. She raced across the road from the woods. For years, she made it all the way, but not today. The, mow the mower drowned out all traffic sounds. I looked up in time to see her curled up to rest, her eyes on me, one paw jerked in a last thought. Traffic straddled her, then slowed down as I wheeled my barrel out to pick her up. I pushed her to the meadow where the bungees lay, a squirrel and generations of dog and cats. Then I finished the mowing of my lawn, feeling lonely. First trip. What? It's only 34 feet to the feeder. The lilac bush is at the end. When replenished with seed, the expressive chickadees form, the lilac tree begins. I've stepped out on the deck and felt their wings in my hair. I call them my house band. They show their passing feathers a place to sing safely. Under the feeder is my chair. I sit, cigar and coffee, bird book. The pair of chipmunks raid under my chair for seed drops. Suddenly, a flock of strangers from the north drop in, a migratory flight. One big bird caught my eye, stayed at the top of the feeder and looked around, saw me with my bird book and felt secure. This time of year, it's hard to tell a species, markings a season old. This migrant looked to the west, September wind clouds, watched dotted lines going south, cloud of species churning, wheeling down the sky. The bird looked at me and freeloaded for his first trip south. I read from the book, page 34. Just keep the north wind at your back, I said. North star over your shoulder. Have a safe trip. See you next year, by the way. <laughs> I yelled as he took off. Your reservations in Nicaragua have been confirmed. This is called roof garden snow. One day, my roof filled up with crystal silences and lay there still until a breeze of chance came by looking for something to stir, a new art form to throw, to rearrange into scrims and folds, iridescencies, then flew off in a temperamental rage. It all fell back upon the roof, a new disorder of things, shapes, scary frozen clouds, and gentle forms, my roof, a sculptor's garden, a memorable show. The sun came out and melted all down the roof, I listened to the waterfall, each drop a sound of music and words telling of their part in it all. In answer to the question often heard, how the hell did you get here? I say, a funny thing happened on my way from the orifice. My doctor dropped me. 
I grabbed the nearest umbilical cord, climbed up hand over hand. A nurse waiting with shears set me free. That's how I got here. But actually, people ask that question when you're up there in the White Mountains. What did, what, how did you get here? <laughs> he answered with that. <laughs> uh, so thank you very, very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed David Baker's poetry. We'll see you next time.